um, I've been praying and thinking a lot on a, on this past week, and the Lord kept speaking to my heart. He said, uh, "Remember when you were younger and you used to play basketball?" And I was on the main squad. I played basketball. But in those days, we had divisional courts for women, you know. Men got to run the whole court, but you had the guards at one end and, and the forwards at the other end, and I happened to be a guard. And, and I got to thinking about that, because he was really bringing that to my mind. And I was going, wow, you know, we had to learn to work together, play together uh, you know we couldn't have one over yonder doing their thing during a game and a, another person over doing something else during a game we had to watch and observe and and move together to win in fact one year we went all the way to the state and we won the championship Hooray! I was kind of proud of that, being that I was in on it, you know. But he began to lead me, and he says, that's what my body's like. You know, in Ephesians it says, Ephesians 4 and 4, it plainly says, there is one body, one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. So, um, we as part of the body are grounded together as a team. And we have to learn to move together, work together in all things because that's how a body works you know this is my hand and my fingers um, but if this hand tried to do something without this hands help if I'm carrying a big well let's just say I pick up my TV and I carry it somewhere and my left hand says oh no I don't want to do that that's just way too much work and my right hand says, oh, yeah, I have to do that. I mean, believe me with my TV, I'm, I'm not going to go anywhere with it. Probably on the floor broken. And so he began to move on me very strongly. And he brought me to Matthew 24, beginning with verse 43. And it says... Know this, that if the good man of the house had have known in what which the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken in. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant when his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? And he really strongly impressed on me that. That as a minister in the body, that, that's what I'm supposed to do. As a minister... I am supposed to be faithful to him to feed and give meat to the body of Christ in due season, you know. And sometimes even I get off a of track, you know. Yep, I sure do. I happen to be flesh and blood. And sometimes I wish that wasn't true because, you know, sometimes us in our own imagination, like we th like to think, I I'm right, you're wrong. No, no, I'm not right, you're not right, God's right. 
Jesus is right. He's, he's our shepherd. He's the one that takes care of the flock, and he's the one that calls us out to take care of each other. Let's go on. It says, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, ha when he cometh, shall find so doing. So when he comes back and he finds us nurturing the flock, the body, feeding them, taking care of them, then we will be blessed. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. And does it not say in Revelations that we shall rule and reign with Jesus at least a thousand years? Praise be to the Holy Spirit and to the moving of the Holy Spirit that God has sent through the word of Jesus Yeshua that will settle upon our hearts and upon our minds and cleansing all the stuff out of our life if we but listen. But listen to what he's saying. But if the evil servant shall come into his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. And we do have people out there that are supposed to be servants, but they have grown weary in waiting for his coming, and they do things that they shouldn't do. 49. And shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunkard. The Lord of these servants shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not weary of, and he shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. They shall be weeping and gashing of teeth. So as a servant of him that has called me, into his righteousness and into his glory I am not supposed to be beating up on my fellow servants I, I, I can't do that that I mean it plainly says if you go out and beat each other up and backbite and chew each other up then it says very plainly that we would be cast out with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gashing of teeth. And this hit me, you know, me, Barbara, not anybody else. I'm not talking to anybody else right now out there because, see, I don't know your heart, but I know my heart. And sometimes I get disobedience. And sometimes I just get so upset. I just want to go out there and say, hey, you. But then God says, yeah. What are you haying about? What are you stomping and getting so mad about? And then I have to back away and go, you know, you're right, Father. I have no right. To really get mad because I have sinned and I have come short of the glory of God. And there has been times I feel like I have missed your calling greatly. And have not done what you have wanted me to do. And I've had to repent. I've had to go on my knees and say, Father, I am so sorry. I'm just sorry that I have come into that. And then sometimes I've had to go back and say, Hey, you know, I I'm sorry that I even thought that about you. You know, you ha I have to go back and apologize. Like, say, Pastor George, I'm sorry. I am sorry I've been bad-mouthed. Or, uh, Ellie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I said that. Because 
when we trans against God, we have to ask God's forgiveness. But if we transgressed against a human being, we need to go and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I was wrong in thinking that. I'm, I'm sorry that I even said that. And I ask for forgiveness. And I've had to do that more times than once. Now, I feel that had Phil Ed to go on, I'm going to read chapter 25, <clears throat> starting with the first down the 13th. And we all know the parable about the ten virgins. And I think this is very plain and very important in this day and hour. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now in the ancient Jewish wedding, there was always ten virgins. And when the woman, I can't think of the name of the carriage that they would pick her up in, there would be four men, two on, uh, in front, two in back, carrying her as she's in this, uh, <sighs> Ellie would know what it's called, but there's five virgins over on one side, five virgins on the other side, and they're walking, taking the bride to her wedding, to her bridegroom. So what does it say? And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. They did not prepare ahead of time. They did not see the concept that the wedding may be a little bit longer than what they think it should be. Uh, so they just take their lamps, no oil to refill it. They think, oh, well, he's going to come right away. And so they take just their lamps. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So the wise virgins were being prepared for the waiting time. They knew in the spirit that it may take longer for his coming than what they had expected. So they made preparations to have an added vessel of oil to carry with them. That's what we should be doing today. Getting those vessels filled up with oil. Now while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Well, you know, sometimes I think, I think you've been tarrying Yeshua for about 2,000 years. Ain't it about time? Isn't, is, isn't it about time? You know, sometimes I get a little patient, impatient. Um, is the sound totally off? Wow. No, okay. Anyway, let's go on. I just want everybody to hear. Um, but let's go on down. While the bride tarried, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now one day, we're going to hear that. Now, I have taught pre-trib, but I have come to the point, I am so tired of hearing this thing going on about pre-trib, mid-trib, or we're going to have to go all the way through it. I have begun to realize, does it matter if we do not have the oil filled, that our vessels filled with oil, uh, when that sound comes, we're going to have problems. 
Then all these virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. So you're seeing the wise and the foolish. They're hearing the call at the same time. The wise virgins hear it just the same as the unwise virgins and vice versa. So they all woke up. They all trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. See, while they were asleep, their lamps was burning and using up their oil. And when it came time for them to trim the wicks, you had to fill up the oil into the lamp so it would keep burning. But, of course, the foolish are saying, give me some of your oil, you know, you know, uh, Ellie, you know, I mean, people could come to you and start asking you questions and trying to feed off of your oil. Pastor George, you know this, I mean, they just seem to come in and they want to suck all the oil out of you so that will leave you with none while they're feeling, trying to fill up. And, and that just don't work anyway. Um, I can't take your oil and you can't take mine. Because when Yeshua gives you an oil in your vessel to be used, that Holy Ruh Kadesh, that Holy Spirit, that anointing oil, when it comes upon you, it is what He has desired to give you, not the other person, but you, because he deals with you and you on a one-to-one -one basis. This is a relationship. He deals with the other person on a one-to-one -one basis. That's a relationship. Let's go on. And the foolish said, oh, uh, after, let's go to nine. But the wise answered saying, not so lest there be not enough for us and you. But you go rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. So the wise will say, go back to your church. Go back to your ministers that are dead and not prone to feed you the anointing oil of the Rukadesh to fill you up with that blessed anointing of knowing Yeshua HaMashiach and, and, and becoming one with Him and being filled with His glory and His grace. Just go back over there, if you can. Buy some. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom come. So while they're running off trying to seek for the anointing oil in the dead and dying church, the bridegroom comes. And they that were ready, very plainly, ready, waiting, went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Afterwards, also the other virgins come. Lord, Lord, open to us. So they must have went and got some kind of oil enough to light a lamp. And, and they come knocking on the door. And they're saying, open up to us. But what does the Lord say to them? But he answers and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch, therefore. For ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. We don't know. I don't know. I have no idea what day nor hour that Yeshua is coming back to earth. I don't know if it's going to be the pre-trip, mid-trip, or if we're all going to have to go 
through the great tribulations. I feel like we're already in some of the great tribulations. I feel like we all get confused because it talks a lot about the seven last years. But it's like anything. Seven last years of what? Seven last years of plenty? Seven last years of trouble? Disaster? So it doesn't mean that we're not going through tribulations right now. It means that those tribulations are going to grow worse and worse and worse right up to the very last day of the last part of the seven years. And that's when Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, comes back on the white horse with a host of heaven's army back to fight at the battle of Armageddon. Will we be ready? Are we preparing to be ready for when He comes? Whatever time He comes. You know, it's time to quit arguing and fussing about how it's going to come about, what day it may come about, what year it may come about, how it may come about, and do I I believe in the pre-trib? I mean, Pastor George knows I do, but it doesn't matter because I want to be ready when he comes, whatever he comes, whether it's pre-trib or not or whatever. It it really doesn't matter if I'm not ready. I'm not going. I'm just not. I will be held accountable for my own actions during that time. So there, I can either be a wise virgin that's like this minister over, that we are to minister to the body of Christ and, and hand out meat in due season, or we can be like the foolish ones that want to go out and make our something, ourselves something more than what we are and beating up on people. You know, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say it. I don't think we have atheists here, but if, if there was, I would have to say, if you don't accept Jesus Christ, and the gift he has d given all of us, I mean, it says all of us. He, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So who should ever believe in him should not perish. Very simple. For the whole world. The good, the bad, and all the other things in between. But yet we have to accept that gift that He gave us, that He died for us. We have to accept that gift. We have to become wise as the wise virgins. We have to become a loving servant that will serve others in meekness, in humbleness, and in love. And sometimes I find that's hard. I do. And I really have to pray and I have to read the scriptures and I have to look and say, Barbara, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Why are you thinking this? See, if I got my finger out at you, accusing you, I have all these fingers pointing back at me also. So I have to learn to talk to you in love and in kindness. And, and love you. I mean, don't do it just in action, but do it in deed. 
I can't say I love you and then mistreat you. I can't say I love you and, and I, I say hateful things to you. I have to apologize to you when I do that. Because in doing that, I have offended you and displeased God when I have tried to, I guess, put you down. And, you know, I do agree with Pastor George on the trolls. I, you know, I, I get sick of the trolls. I mean, I really do. Because some of them are out just to hurt, hurt people. To put them down. To break them down. But isn't that what Satan does to us all? You know, he is the accuser of the brethren. He is setting up there right now. He hasn't been kicked totally out of heaven. He gets to go up there amongst the congregation, like with Job. And he'll sit there with his hands folded in his head, throw back, and God may say, Hey, how about my man, Pastor George? How about my woman, Ella, or even Barbara? Or, or so many of the others out there. He's sitting there and he'll go, yeah, right. Yeah, you got a hedge around him. You take that hedge down for five seconds and I'll show you what they'll do. And you know what? Sometimes, like Job, God permits it. He really does. And you may say, well, why would God do that to you if you're trying to serve Him? I have learned throughout my time of serving God, of trying to walk in His likeness, that I've had to go through some really, really hard things as a testing and a growing to prepare me for other things that he's getting ready to put me through. You know, like a testimony to somebody, a, a, a showing a light to somebody, or walking through the valley of the shadow of death. He's preparing us to go through the uttermost. And believe me, if we have to go through all of this to the very end, we've only begun to face bad things to come. Think about it. When the Antichrist comes, he will demand everyone to take the mark. If you don't, then you will have to pay the penalty. If we cannot stand now in the little tribulations that we have going on in our lives, and this is what he's really showed me, if I, Barbara, cannot stand in the little things, and they seem big to me at the time they're going on, but they're little things compared to the things that I will have to go through. Will I be able to stand? Will I be able to stand when I say, no, I'm not going to take the mark, and they won't let me buy food? They won't let me take care of myself. If I'm sick, I won't be able to go to the hospital and get any help. I'll have to totally rely on Him and Him alone. I will have to rely on Him to feed me, to keep me well, to, to get me through all of this and still let the glory of Him shine forth in the midst of all of this chaos going on around us. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. 
And I don't say that to fear, make people fear. I'm saying this, so be ready. Get ready. Get ready in here. Be prepared to stand no matter what goes on. No matter what's happening. We have to stand. This week, he's just really been dealing with me on this. If you can't stand in this, then how can you stand in that? If you can't stand in this, and I'm calling you to walk in a deeper walk and go out there in places that may take your life, can you do it? He's really been getting on me. Prepare yourself. Prepare. Put your whole faith in me, your whole trust in me, your whole love in me, and no one else. You know, um, about Gideon, not to just bring up my almighty wind, but you know, when they talked about Gideon, and I went back over there, and you can go and read it in, uh, I'll give you the verse, because I'm not going over there, but uh, Judges 7, read chapter that, you'll find out that Gideon had a huge army, but God didn't want that many men to be there to go out and fight the battle. So he said, if anybody is afraid, you, you tell them, Gideon, to go home. Don't need them. There's too many men anyway. So Gideon said, spoke the words of the Lord, and a whole slew went home. But still, God said, there's just too many. You know, I, I want this battle to be my battle. I want to have the glory out of you winning this battle. So, he says, there's still too many men. So, he says, now, you have them to go down there and drink from the river, and those who lap like a dog out of the river, go home. Those that aren't being down, you know, you take it and you take the water up. Reason why, they were watching. They were watching out there amongst the hills to see if the enemy was about to come. They were prepared to fight at any, any instance, any moment, any second. They were ready to fight. So it ended up with only 300 men. And you've got a vast army out there to fight. I mean, the valley was full of your enemies. And you got only 300 men to fight a war? But that's what God said to do. So he tells Gideon how to do it. And not only did he say, you take the 300 men, but you divide them up in sections of 100. And you surround them. You have 300, I mean, 100 over here, 100 over here, and 100 here. And they have th their lamps with, you know, the, the top over the candle where people couldn't see the light. And they had a trumpet. And the left hand was the light. And the right hand was the trumpet. And he said, now, you tell them when you blow, they are to do the same thing. And they did. They caused the enemy to turn on each other and destroy each other for fear. And you may say, what does that have to do with this now? I think it has everything. He can take the little old you in the time of trouble and defeat a whole army that is coming against you because he will give you that anointing oil that anointing power to be over you to protect you to guide you in all this trouble 
So you see, I really have no fear if I do have to go all the way to the end. If I have to walk it all the way through and I have to see all of this stuff come up and I and I see the mark of the beast and I see the armies rumbling through the streets of America taking you into captivity because you even speak the name of Jesus Christ. You even say that I'm against abortion. I mean, like that judge that Pastor George talked about. Make it, it a constitutional thing. That if you say that it is wrong to have an abortion... It's going against the Constitution of the United States. Well, you know what? I've studied the Constitution of the United States. I don't see that anywhere in the Constitution. Maybe he sees something I don't see. And it's coming to a point, even if you say anything about homosexual marriages, because, you know, states are saying it's okay. Get married. But there'll be a day that when we say anything against it, they'll come after us. I'm just trying to warn people we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared. It, no matter what hour, what day, or what condition, the circumstances going on, we have to be prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ Yeshua at all times because when he comes he's going to come with a great trumpet and it will shake this world and people will see him and they will fall on their faces before him no matter whether you believe in him or no matter whether you do. I know I will fall on my face before him because I know that I am unworthy. I know this as a fact. And it's him that maketh me anyway potentially ready or perfect or anything because it's through his blood that bought and paid for me on that cross that day for my sins that makes me what I am today I am nothing without him I am absolutely 100% nothing I have no power I have no authority. I have nothing without him. But what did it say in Mark? It gave us to a commission to go out and preach the gospel to the whole world. He gave us authority to cast out demons and to walk on serpents. He gave us that authority. The last chapter of Mark. It's the Great Commission that He has signed to us all. But He has signed it to us that we will show His glory. You know, like Gideon had to show the authority of God and the power of God in total obedience, cutting His huge army down to a handful of men to fight a huge army, a huge nation, powerful. And God chose only 300 men to stand with Gideon to go to battle. We may be small in number, 
but we are mighty in Him. And we need to pull together as one. We that are of the virgins that are wise need to stand together, work together as one in His holy name for His glory and His righteousness. For He has given us this wisdom to fill up in His anointing and His power. And you know, I feel compassion for people. I, I do. And there's people that I would just love to just reach out, grab a hole, and shake until their teeth rattle. You know, that's an old saying of my, my grandmother. I just want to shake you until your teeth rattle, child. <laughs> I remember that. And when my grandmother said it, you know, the little Jewish grandmother that I had, when she would say that, I knew she meant it. And I knew Barbara better straighten up really fast because I'm going to have a swat right where you sat down at. Oh, yes. My grandmother could do that. But I still knew she loved me. That's the way he is sometimes, you know. God chastises us sometimes. And boy, when he does, I go, oh, I messed up. I know I've messed up. Badly. Or he wouldn't chastise me in sometimes the way he does. But you know what? I'm glad he does. I, I really am. I am so glad. Yes, my, my little grandmother on my mama's side was Jewish. And she was married to a full-blooded German. <laughs> Wasn't that something? But they were very spiritual. I, I watched my grandmother and my grandpa. My grandpa was a Southern Baptist minister and he rode the hills of Missouri. He preached as a circuit rider and he would stand on stumps as, as he preached. So I come from a long line of ministers. And I learned a lot from my grandmother and my grandpa. And there would be things that my grandmother would do that I have learned that were Jewish, but she never told me about these things. She just, she would light her candles and do her things, and I'd sit there and I'd go, okay, and, and she'd pray, and, and I never thought anything about it. Not one thing did I ever think about what she was doing. Never even recognized what she was doing uh, in her own way. And as I become into researching and studying the Jewish roots, I begin to say, wow, that's what my grandma did. Hmm, wow, that's interesting. But she was very strict on a lot of things. And if you use your potty mouth, oh yeah, my grandmother knew how to wash your mouth out with soap. I got my mouth washed out a couple of times. Just like sometimes I know God washes my mouth out with soap too. But as I was thinking more and more, and the scriptures were coming to me, 
I have to straighten up. I really do. We are in the end days. Jesus is coming back. We don't know what hour. We don't know what day. We don't know what time. But we do know He's coming back because He said He was going to go to prepare us a place. If it were not so, He wouldn't have told us. But being that He's going to prepare us a place, He's going to come back to get us. When? I don't know. But I know He's coming. And I know I have to be ready. I know I have to have my vessel of extra oil filled to the brim, flowing over. It's got to be filled. So when that time comes and I need to trim the wick on the lamp and I need to take it up and fill it up with the oil, the extra oil that I brought and put the wick back down there and light it, that it will be burning bright. It will be burning brightly when it comes. That it won't be burnt out and run out. But that it will be burning brightly. And I have failed. More times than I care to think about. And I've had to get on my knees many times and pray for forgiveness. I'm not better than anybody. I'm not more important than anybody. I am simply a handmaiden picked out by Him to do a specific work in this day and in this hour and in this time. For why? For the body of Christ that it will grow strong and it will be knitted together as one in love in working together you know like when I played basketball I worked with all my teammates I was on the main squad and when we were out there on the court and we were playing ball I had to watch Everyone, I had to watch the other guards that were trying to keep the other team from making a score and trying to get a hold of that ball to get it back down there to the forward players that would, you know, make uh, baskets. I wasn't never a very good shot. That's the reason why I wasn't a forward. So, but I was a good guard, and that's where the coach put me. He put me where I was best efficient at, best use at on that team. And through the years of playing with these girls, year after year, we could almost read each other's movements and thoughts because we played together so much. We worked together so much. We knew what the other was thinking. And if I had the ball and I was going to throw it down there to the forward, uh, the girls down there, I would always try to make sure that I'm watching. And I'm not going to throw the ball to someone that's got two or three guards on her, keeping her trying to keep her from getting the ball. And usually they did that really well with um, uh, a good player, uh, one that really made a lot of baskets. Boy, it just like whoosh, bees. But you wait until you find that one that's away from the guards, and you throw it to her so she can either make a basket or get it to someone down there that can make a basket. That's working together. That's teamwork. And he began to show me that more and more throughout this week. I mean, really show me this more than more uh, throughout the whole week. 
that we are a team. We are working together for the glory of God. We are dedicating our lives to Him that He can let His light shine through us. Because, see, He's the head and we're the body. And we have to let His light shine through us so that others will see. That's, that's why Yeshua said, we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth because He has called us. He has put that light. He has made us a temple. We no longer have a temple over in Jerusalem where people will take sheep and goats and things to do sacrificial offerings on. We have that right here. Right here. We are the temple now. And we are to give him a sacrificial offering of our hearts. That it will be circumcised in the righteousness of him. Cleansed in him. That we will walk in his light and his glory. That we can stand with him. We are in the last days. And He is coming back to earth. I truly believe within my own lifetime. And you'll say, well, Barbara, you're 68 years old. He better come fast. Hey, I could live to be 100. I don't have to die at 68 or 70 or even 80. I could make it to 100 if it takes that long. Just saying. You know, I may not know the hour or date, but I know he's coming. Hallelujah. I know he's coming. I know it without a shadow of a doubt. And when all the things that are happening, when all the crud here in America happens, when we go over the physical cliff, if that's what we happen, if uh, if the thing down in Louisiana blows like atomic, you know, bomb, you know what? He is our protector, and we are to send the word out that he is our covering in in any kind of disaster. He is our covering. And you know, if he chooses that I go home before Yeshua comes, I'll still get to see him. Yeah, I know. I know I'll get to see him. Whether it be in life, with my physical eyes seeing him coming, or whether it be in death and he takes me by the hand, wraps his arms around me, and he takes me home. You know what? It just doesn't matter. Because I know, I know that I know that I know who he is. And that we have to come to the point that we let him totally cleanse our life, out. I have found out through some experience throughout this week that many times things will happen to us in our life. And so to deal with some of these things, we'll put them in a box, put a lid on the box, nail it shut, take it into them, that closet in our mind, and we'll put it on the very top shelf and we'll put it way back in the back and pile a bunch of junk on top of it so we don't have to deal with it. We don't have to remember it. And then something come along and, and it, it jumps right out of that closet, right out of that box and smacks you right in the head. And you go, oh wow, I thought I had taken care of that. 
I, I'm learning right now. God is saying to me, let me go into your closet. Let me dig into those darkest places of pain and hurt that you have boxed up, put back there, and let me cleanse them out. Let me take them out of there. I'll cleanse them for you. I'll take care of them for you. And if anything else that you get out of this whole message, that's what he's wanting to do with all of us. He's wanting to clean up the scars. He's wanting to heal them. And he's wanting to take care of all of that little junk that we, you know, you, through life you just don't want to deal with it. So you just put it back there. But he wants to clean it up and make us whole in him. One with him so that we can stand in these last days you know Ephesians plainly tell us to put on the whole armor of God so that in the days of evil we can stand <sighs> Father as I come to the end of this teaching that you really strongly laid on my heart if not for anybody else for me to wake up thank you thank you for teaching me this because I do want to be a wise virgin I want to be ready for you when you come I want to have the oil filled up and I don't want to be a servant that has gave up and going out and doing things that shouldn't be doing. I, I want to be that one that you have called out to feed your children, the body, and bringing it together as one and not separating. Father, I truly ask for total forgiveness from you. And if I have offended anyone, let me forgive them and them forgive me. So that we can grow together as one in you and not apart. Bring blessings. Bring the anointing to your body in these last days and these last hours that we can stand to be a mighty force for you no matter what's going on. I'm asking for this in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Let it be so. And amen and amen.